Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and um, I'm really thrilled to be here. I, uh, I'm probably going to need these as much as I would like not to, but I'm going to keep them on. Um, it, is, it is truly a real pleasure uh, to be here today at St. Francis College, SFC, as I've come to understand. Um, and thank you to the provost very much, and to Tom and Anita Volpe for making this lecture series possible. Um, truly a unique 20 years of uh, amazing speakers that you've had here. Um, and thank you, Dr. Forsberg, very much for that generous introduction. Um, it, is, it is certainly a, a great honor, as I said, to be a part of this distinguished list of speakers who have appeared before you uh, in years past. Um, many of these lectures have brought much personal insight and inspiration to, to many, many folks. I, I hope I can do that a little bit today in my world of uh, creativity, um, exploration, um, maybe some innovation. That's an important thing in our, in our world of, of architecture and design. Um, but I, I'm going to share with you today um, a few of the most meaningful lessons that have been important to me in developing my career as an architect and in becoming a leader in my industry. The ability to understand and utilize, as I said, these concepts of creativity and innovation have allowed me and my firm to develop some really very exciting, fresh, I'd like to think bold, um, innovative and relevant projects from hotels to restaurants to uh, retail, um, stores, uh, and to residential work. Uh, I'm doing a lot more residential now, and, and I enjoy it very much. It, uh, the hospitality world has sort of invaded the residential world, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful exploration for me. Um, what, I, what I have discovered, really, are, are some of the essential elements of creativity and innovation, how I came to understand their role and how they are reflected in some of the projects that I've worked on, I, I'm going to be showing you today. Hopefully, they will also be of use to you in developing a successful approach to the challenges in achieving your own career goals. But first, let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I became an architect. Um, having grown up in New York City, uh, as many people, uh, I've had the opportunity to be exposed to a wide variety of people and lifestyles and diversity and culture and quite frankly my, my interest in architecture and design stems very much in part from the kind of undeniable control that I've seen New York's environment uh, exercise over its inhabitants. Growing up here was a very powerful experience and, and still is and continues to be. I don't think there's a day that uh, I've not Walk. I enjoy walking in New York a lot. I, every day I walk and find and see things and see things I've never seen before. It's very inspiring. Um, the city is just uh, an incredible melting pot, but a, 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 an intense environment for creative thought um, and inspiration. Um, both of my parents, as Dr. Forsberg mentioned, uh, were in the travel industry and they would often bring me on um, international trips uh, as a teenager. So I, I was, as a young person, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to develop an appreciation for uh, other cultures and art forms and music and the arts uh, internationally. Um, I think that inspired me more than I really knew at the time. Um, but um, when I was in high school, I actually was not a, a big fan of the way the school was designed. Quite, quite frankly, the um, cafeteria was too far away from everything else. The hallways were too small. The classrooms were too small. And it was just a, quite a very convoluted place. So I, I, I proposed and suggested as an in independent project as a junior to redesign the school. <laughs> well, they somehow said, OK. Uh, go for it. And uh, it was a really exciting project. Um, I was a lifeguard in a, in a pool one summer, and I met a young uh, gentleman who was a student at Pratt. And I became very good friends uh, with him. 
He was a few years older than I was, but he taught me many, many things. And back in the day, we didn't have computers and we didn't have uh, uh, all sorts of drawing techniques. So I had to draw by hand. And he taught me all of that as a high school student. Um, very, very special person, Gary Redeker. Um, but, uh, well, I, I went on to become an architecture student from there at uh, the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, and this is where I also became fascinated with the, with the medium of glass and the amazing creativity of glass blowing. Uh, in addition to my architecture work at RISD, I studied and befriended the renowned glass artist uh, whose name is Dale Chihuly. Um, my architecture studio as a, as a young uh, sophomore, I think, we were located in the, so in the sculpture building. They were rebuilding the, the architecture building. So I would be up, of course, all night long drawing with, with pens that are, are uh, you know, the tips of the, uh, needles. And my eyes would be gone and I would wander into the glass lab and unbelievable creative things were being made there. Um, astounding color, astounding form, astounding, um, as you can see, just, just the energy of creativity was, uh, blew my mind. Um, Dale was, was larger than life at the time. And uh, I, I really just, while blowing with Dale and working in glass, I discovered actually this remarkable material. It can be beautifully formed and textured and can have an amazing, powerful, bold, dynamic expression of color and form. And it, it really complemented the, the rigor and the um, discipline of architecture. It, it was sort of this amazing, uh, a unique sort of extraordinary opposite component um, to, to the work of architecture. It, it, architecture was very uh, cerebral, uh, very focused, where glass blowing, of course, was a dance. It was a ballet. It was emotive. Um, and in creativity, emotion is huge. It's, uh, if you can balance sort of a, an emotional thought with a disciplined thought, um, for me, at least, it's been a, an incredibly um, inspiring way of thinking. And I'd like to think in all of my work, it comes out from color to form to emotion. Um, I'm not a theoretical or academic uh, designer architect. My work is very emotive. Um, I want to make beautiful things. I try to make beautiful things. I, um, that's what inspires me. Um, my interest in the relationship uh, and the integration, really, of architecture and glass uh, led to a Fulbright Fellowship uh, for study in Brazil, where I, I worked with the celebrated Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that, actually. I, 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 I went to see Oscar uh, to interview him. Uh, I was writing a thesis on architecture and. Uh, the integration of art and architecture, and Oscar Niemeyer was very involved in landscape design and many Brazilian architects at the time and artists. So my Portuguese was probably about as good as his English uh, at that point, um, but he granted the, the interview, and I think he thought I was looking for a job. I, uh, and he basically sort of came out and said, you know, would you like to work here? And I said, of course, I would be honored. And, so he offered me an opportunity to work uh, in his office uh, in a penthouse in Copacabana Beach at uh, 24, 25 years old. So I said yes. Um, he, he was a remarkable man. He, he passed a couple years ago at the age of 104. Um, just, just an astounding uh, architect and artist. He loved New York. He loved hearing. Uh, he wanted to know everything about New York. So he would take me for these walks. We'd go have our lunch hour, and we'd go take these walks down Copacabana Beach and just grill me on everything about New York and where should I go and what should I do and well, who's, who's doing what. And it was just a, a remarkably um, oh, memorable experience for me. Um, I enjoyed it tremendously, but at some point I sort of said, OK, I, had, I was there for maybe a year and a half. And I said, all right, I, I better get back to the States here. And, start thinking of it. I loved Rio, I loved Brazil. It was a, a wonderful uh, experience, but I thought about more about being an architect. So 
Um, I, upon my return to the US, I had the honor of joining the, the New York office of, of IM Pei. Um, IM was uh, a modernist and is a modernist. He's uh, an extremely um, uh, talented uh, diplomat. I, I learned a great deal from IM Pei about glass, about the high rise use of glass. So this was really more of the architectural, disciplined approach to the medium. And I wanted to learn everything I could about it, about using glass in, in buildings, in controlling heat and light, and um, really sort of bringing light into interior spaces. I, I was fascinated by that. Um, I was lucky enough that I, I helped him, uh, I helped design the, the acclaimed Raffle City Hotel complex in Singapore. And I became fascinated, honestly, by the dynamics of hotel design with the lobbies, the restaurants, the public spaces, uh, the social spaces of hotels and, and hospitality. They're, they're dynamic things to work with. You work with color, you work with material, you look with form. Um, building design, again, is sort of this rigorous, disciplined uh, elevator cores and fire stairs and plan layouts. Where interiors, one can explore a lot of emotive things, a lot of things that are really come from inside. Um, as opposed to up in the brain. I like that. I found it in, uh, incredibly uh, euphoric. So it, it sort of brought my glass world right back into being an architect and a young architect in Manhattan. Um, so I, I worked with IM on the pyramids and we, we sort of had a, a lovely experience. I was there for, oh gosh, I don't know, eight years, seven or eight years, I forget. But um, in 1986, I, I uh, was coming back from Singapore after being there for four or five months, opening Raffle City and exhausted and going on a couple week vacation. I met a restaurateur. And I met a restaurateur through friends and he was considering a space in Manhattan. It was 200 feet long by 33 feet wide. So it went from Broadway to Mercer and he honestly just didn't know what to do with it. He was sort of like, what do I do with this very narrow, block-long space? And he said, would you come into the city and take a look at it with me? We'll talk about it. I said, sure, you know, I really wanted to be on vacation, but no, 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 okay. Um, I was blown away. I thought it was an amazing space, and I said to him, we're gonna build the longest bar in New York. We're gonna build a 180 long foot bar, and we're gonna put an open display kitchen in the middle of it, um, and I think that's, this was called Bar Louis. Um, it was my first restaurant project. Um, I blew out actually 35 uh, wall sconces, light fixtures, uh, myself in a, in a little facility uh, called the New York Experimental Glass Workshop on Mulberry Street. Um, it was located in Little Italy. Well, we are, we are now known as Urban Glass. You may or may not know it. I, friends and associates are sitting in the office in the, in the audience. Um, it is now a very large uh, glass making facility it's called Urban and it's located just down the street, actually on Fulton Street. Um, I hope you all have a chance to go and visit Urban Glass. It's an amazing, amazing facility with very talented artists. Um, the, the, the facility offers all sorts of programs and Blowing glass, uh, casting glass, neon work, lamping, lamp working, uh, many, many different forms of glass making. The open kitchen and then uh, the wall sconces. Um, so I guess, you know, what does it mean to be innovative or what does it mean to be creative? Um, it has become a bit of a buzzword of late, I think. Um, many claim that we're in the midst of the innovation age. Um, I disagree with that. I actually believe that innovation is and, ho and has always been an essential part of, of any business endeavor, but probably any of our personal endeavors. Uh, innovation really is taking something and making it better. Um, I think it's uh, a part of all of our lives in many, many different ways. Um, I, I have read actually that innovation is the process of transforming an idea or a concept or an invention into something that people find valuable. 
that people find is something that further satisfies or exceeds their needs and expectations. It's interesting, you know, creativity, a lot of people sometimes think that innovative, being innovative is being creative. It is and it isn't. I, I think being creative is being vulnerable. To be creative, you have to really just open yourself and allow yourself to fail. You have to allow yourself to take risk. Innovation, I think, is a more disciplined approach to taking something and making it better. So the two kind of go hand in hand, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it, it really, innovation is not that stereotypical aha moment where the light bulb goes off, but rather it's actually an accumulation of events, of interactions that build on existing concept or existing things in order to make them better. Um, I, uh, the possibility of harm or loss, a factor involving uncertain danger. If one looks in any dictionary, you would find that this is the definition of risk. Risk is a very important part of, of being an architect or a designer. You, you, you have to take risk in everything you do. Um, I believe that innovation is essentially risk taking on steroids. And in order to create new and better products and services, we must all take on much greater risk. I endeavor to take risks in all of my work by constantly pushing the boundaries of design. Whether it is through the exploration of a new material or a new technology, or the unique application of classic elements, or glass elements, or metal elements, or uh, electronic elements, or um, almost holographic elements, elements that may or may not be there. Um, it's, it's a fa fantastic way to create dynamic, interactive, engaging, bold spaces. And really, my effort is always to engage the individual. Um, my interest in hospitality really comes from being a host. It, it, I love uh, being with people and being with friends and engaging the guests. In, in hotel design, it's all about the guest. I really don't have a client other than all of us. Um, it's an amazing project type to work on. Um, an innovator, like innovation itself, builds off the knowledge of his or her predecessors. So I wouldn't be where I am today without the friends and mentors who have provided priceless advice and encouragement to me along the way. My grandfather, Charles Beersman was the chief architect of the Wrigley Building in Chicago. He, he once said to my father, it's okay to be scared, but don't be afraid. I thought about that, and that's what risk is. You can certainly be scared of, of taking a risk, but don't be afraid, because it will usually yield uh, a result that um, not only inspires you and everyone around you, but create something new. Um, you have to be willing to fail and to take risk. And don't be afraid. Um, these words I will carry with me forever. Um, Charles Beersman and my father, he gave me the courage to try, to never give up, and to take risks, even though that may present the possibility of a failure. I remember very early in my career, <laughs> with Disney, um, the Walt Disney Company wanted to come and interview us and visit my office. This was a very early time in, in my career. Well, we were maybe four or five people at the time. Um, and I knew I had to do something. Um, so I called a bunch of friends of mine and I said, guys, will you come in and, and sit at desks and, and draw stuff, just draw stuff. Like, like I had four or five people come and, and draw stuff I had some other friends call the office every like five, 10 minutes, right? Like, we're really busy. We got all this stuff going on. Well, I mean, we were also above a Chinese restaurant. And this was this little, little shop I had. And the, the owner of the, Ch I had to convince the owner of the Chinese restaurant not to use the smoker. The smoker was this incredibly smelly thing that every morning he would take off. So 10 lunches later that I guaranteed him uh, he didn't use the smoker that morning, but um, I'm very proud to say we got the job from Disney. So, have to take risk. You have to take. You have to take action. Um, 
the mentor I credit with showing me that there is no substitute for hard work is actually Dale. Dale Chihuly, Dale believed that the quality of artistic creativity is in direct proportion to one's commitment to our effort, our risk, and our enthusiasm. Um, as an artist, Dale embodied the boldest sense of color and daring design ideas I actually had ever met, um, and still do. Um, Dale cultivated in me a passion for the pursuit of artistic expression. Even though I was an architect, the pursuit of artistic expression uh, is something that I think is, is so important. Um, he, he cultivated in creative thinking and much risk-taking and tremendous enthusiasm. That is who he is and continues to be, a very inspiring person for me. He nurtured not only my mind, but also my spirit and my soul. For that, I will always be grateful, because I believe it is actually the very essence of being creative and being a successful innovator. I have read that creativity demands the ability to be unafraid of failure and to take much risk, because creativity can equal failure. Yes, it can. Good things can come out of failure. I think we all know that, but to take the risk to fail is challenging. Um, you may be surprised to hear such a statement, but it is true. The philosopher Charles Frankel asserted that, <laughs> I love this one, anxiety, anxiety, I'm an anxious person, anxiety is the essential condition of intellectual and artistic creation. That's pretty interesting, right? <laughs> Think about that one. Um, I like that one. But creativity requires a willingness to look stupid and be vulnerable, and it means taking risk. You have to be vulnerable in order to create something. If, you, if your arms are, are closed and the walls are around you, you'll never see beyond anything new. Um, maybe it's not a new idea, but it's an important one. It, it's been uh, a hallmark of, of my firm. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with 45, 50 folks that are uh, really, really talented people. And the culture really embodies that. There's, there's never really a, there's no bad idea ever in a, in a critique or a, a, a review of a project. It's just whether it's appropriate or not for this particular project. I encourage everyone in my firm to speak, to speak, to share their voice, to uh, explore new possibilities. That is really, to me, what, uh, it's all about and brings me great joy every day. Um, you know, taking risk. I, I remember when we were doing the Russian Tea Room on 57th Street, again, a number of years ago, but with a, a very flamboyant and eccentric restaurateur. You may remember him, Warner Leroy. Uh, God bless Warner. Warner was the son of Melvin Leroy, who was the director of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, Warner owned the, the, the uh, Tavern on the Green restaurant in Central Park and, you know, the chandeliers and the glass and the, it went on and on and on, the, the glitter and pomp and circumstance of Warner Valori. Um, I had the pleasure of working with him, but it, it, I just couldn't get the oversized dancing bears to look quite right. Um, I couldn't get the... the giant Fabergé egg centerpieces that he wanted in the dining room to be big enough or colorful enough or Warner enough. So he fired me. I was devastated. I was disappointed, of course, but I learned that maybe dancing bears and Fabergé eggs were just not my thing. So I carried on. Um, over 30 years ago, I started my career with the architect I am Pei. Mr. Pei, uh, who was an incredibly and is, uh, as I said, a diplomat. He is a gentleman. Um, he is an amazing mentor and teacher. He, he taught me many things, but perhaps uh, most powerful and important was to have courage and enthusiasm to always aim as high as you can and never give up. I am Pei was, is uh, a, a remarkable fighter. Um, he is a true um, spirit, uh, is a very disciplined, modernist architect, uh, but he has a tremendous heart and he knows uh, how to achieve something. 
I will never forget uh, a, a boardroom. I, I went with him to a presentation uh, to the board of Mount Sinai Hospital. And we were, of course, 30% over budget or 40% over budget or something. And um, I am thought deeply about it. Um, there were 40 board members who were not pleased and wanted to hear about it. Well, in the course of uh, 30 minutes, I, I watched uh, this gentleman um, take the board, show them why the building should be the way it is, what it will do for uh, not only recipients of the hospital services, but the community and everyone at large, that it was really, it could be a responsibility of the board to think about the things that he was proposing. Well, in 25 minutes, he managed to actually take this board of, of, of not happy uh, folks and turn them into pulling out their checkbooks and where can I write a check? I, I'll never forget that. It, it was an amazing um, thing to watch an architect uh, have the diplomacy and ability to do that. It came from emotion. It really wasn't his intellect. It was more from the heart. Um, that really amazed me. He instilled in me really the courage and confidence to be myself, to take risks and to be my own person. Uh, I, I remember when I, I came to him and I, I, I mentioned, I said to him that I, I wanted to start my own practice. Um, I had some opportunities. Bar Louis was published in 17 magazines around the world and it was my first project. I, I was overjoyed, I was thrilled. I had a wonderful career ahead of me at IMP, but I also had this opportunity. And I wanted to take the opportunity. And I remember uh, asking IM to lunch and sharing that with him. He was an amazingly supportive, uh, encouraging um, supporter of mine. He, he embraced it. Um, it's one thing if you're maybe going down the street to another shop, but he knew that I was going to try and put my name on the door. And I, I will never forget his support, his encouragement, uh, and his open door if I fell down and wanted to return. Um, that was huge as a 28, 29 year old uh, in New York. So I will never forget him. Um, I am deeply indebted to each of these men for providing me with a strong foundation and the core beliefs for building a successful career. The formula for creativity and, and innovation that they helped me to define has been a backbone of my accomplishments to date. So with that, uh, I thought this might be a good time to just show you some of the work that my firm has been doing over the years. Um, I guess I'm going to take this one and see if we can, we can go from here. So from Bar Louis, um, this was a restaurant in, in Midtown Manhattan called China Grill. We ended up doing six of them around the world. Um, but China Grill was located in the CBS building on 52nd Street and 6th Avenue. Um, I'd like to think one of the innovative things about this project was it was three restaurants before China Grill and each one failed. Each one failed miserably and no one could really figure out why. Uh, the CBS execs were all upset and Jeffrey Chattero, the restaurateur, invited me to come and take a look at it. Um, I said, well, it's obvious. There were, there were two rooms. There was a big room, sort of like a, a Four Seasons wannabe. There was a, a room on 53rd Street, and then a sort of narrow corridor, and then another room on 52nd Street. Well, they used to have the bar in one room and the dining room in another room. Immediate disaster. I mean, it, 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 as far as the China Grill concept for a restaurant, to be innovative about this, the idea would be to put the bar and the kitchen in the center so that it unifies the space. It's no longer a dumbbell shape, it's one space. So there's tremendous dynamics and energy. Uh, I'm very proud to say China Grill is celebrating its 31st anniversary uh, in 2017. We opened it in 1987. 31 years for a restaurant is pretty good. I'm very proud of that one. Um, <clears throat> the light fixtures we invented in the ceiling, they're, they're made of sailcloth, but they came from glass blowing. They were derived from uh, working in glass blowing, and I think I first blew out some things and thought I could do them out of glass. That was impossible, so I had to go to a, a, a sailcloth. Um, 
These were the wall sconces. I blew these two at, at China Grill, just uh, um, more of a, a riff on, on the Bar Louis uh, sconces. Um, this was China Grill in Miami. Um, I'm just going to kind of thumb through this to give you a sense of uh, the, the range of work we've done, from restaurants to bars to, as Dr. Forsberg said, Forsberg said uh, Jay-Z. We just did uh, 4040 uh, in Manhattan, his uh, sports club for Jay-Z. So this was China Girl, uh, the bathroom. This was uh, a kind of a new idea in, in, in Miami where it was a co-ed bathroom. The, the vanity area was shared, shared uh, unisexed, and then you would go into the individual. Well, I remember the Miami uh, at the time, uh, the plumbers were not too happy with the, the concept of that. And they, they looked at this New York guy. I mean, he doesn't know what he's doing. And it was, it's interesting, this world that I live in. It's, uh, a lot of fun, um, trying to grill Mexico City. We invented uh, a sort of a faux skylight of, of roses. This was the ladies' room, so this kind of skylight out of glass uh, inlaid with roses. Uh, made everyone look good. The ladies looked really good, so that was key. Um, trying to grill uh, Mexico City outdoor areas, bars, uh, uh, congregation. This is a restaurant called Zoe in Soho. In the 90s, terracotta columns, uh, walnuts, uh, the, the glass, of course, sconces over the bar, uh, other blown glass fixtures back at the Expo Kitchen in the back. Um, very artistic project. Uh, many friends of mine, painters, artists, and sculptors, and glass blowers worked on this project. Um, um, another shot of Zoe, the open kitchen. This was back in when a display kitchen was just in its first incarnation. Um, Calle Ocho, this was a, a modern Cuban restaurant up in the Upper West Side. Um, I was enamored at the time uh, um, with, with these are little glass rondelles. Uh, so the back of this dining room, uh, I, I placed it and uh, adhered all these little rondelles on an illuminated wall. Uh, it, it was a nice piece for this restaurant, very colorful. Um, the main dining room in Calle Ocho um, sort of made up this kind of uh, ceiling technique that, uh, again, form, it, it really derived out of a blown form. It was a glass form that uh, all of a sudden realized it could be a ceiling. Um, Rum Jungle Las Vegas, we did a lot of work out in Las Vegas. This was uh, an amazing sort of, well, it started out as a restaurant, but then it, it, as the evening goes on, it morphs into a club and becomes this uh, uh, sort of dynamic, uh, crazy place. Um, Light fixtures, the chandeliers are all little Pyrex uh, tubes um, uh, run on fishing line. Um, we, design, we design all the furniture, we design all the light fixtures uh, for all of our properties. Uh, another shot of Rum Jungle, the DJ booth and this giant uh, hut and structure in the back. Uh, glass bar, of course, uh, those are cast uh, glass bar tops. <clears throat> Japané, Japané, a uh, French-Japanese fusion restaurant in Chicago. Uh, we did three of them, one in Chicago, one here, and one in Las Vegas. Um, the glass over the bar uh, and the sushi bar. Um, again, just lots of different materiality. Uh, walnuts, uh, different types of woods, uh, different types of metals. Um, Japané here in New York, I blew out all these little fixtures for the, the centerpiece in the dining room. Um, this colorful uh, uh, technique. Um, some shots blowing, um, other fixtures. These were some of the, sh some of the fixtures for, for China Grill and uh, also Japanese. Uh, Blue Zoo, uh, this was one down in, in Disney uh, in Orlando for Todd English. Um, we tried to be inventive. We tried to invent all of our projects. Um, uh, this was 50 St. James in London, um, large uh, chandeliers that, that we designed and had fabricated in, in Venice. Um, uh, the lower uh, nightclub at 50 St. James, again, these glass fixtures, they were done by Las Vite, um, a wonderful company in Czechoslovakia that we've done a lot of work with. Uh, we designed them and they fabricated them. Uh, glass illuminated floor. Um, it was sort of the idea of a runway. Uh, they ran fashion shows here all the time. It was a very successful uh, club. Um, ono, Japanese restaurant in Soho called Ono. Uh, tattooing is a big deal in Japan. So I had an artist actually make these sort of overscaled, uh, over-the-top 
uh, tattoos for the tatami rooms. Um, Toy, uh, a restaurant down in um, um, uh, the meatpacking district. Um, a lot of layering of, of glass elements from prisms to mirror, um, sort of a very uh, fashion-centric restaurant concept. Uh, this was the Villard House, uh, a landmark property on, on Madison Avenue. Um, we, of course, uh, had to work with a lot of the architecture. and There was the innovative challenge. The restaurant actually was not successful for many years. Um, we did a whole new lighting concept and put the bar into the first room. It was never in the first room. It was in the last room. That was a very successful improvement on what it was. Um, innovative idea that turned into something into a better product. Uh, Milos, uh, a Greek concept. This is one in Miami. We've done Milos in Las Vegas and Miami. Uh, we're about to start one in Dubai. Um, wonderful uh, concept. There's one here in New York. It's been here for 20-something years. Fantastic food, by the way. Um, uh, this is a restaurant, uh, Pamia. This is a Jean George restaurant where we invented a new sort of meat locker. Uh, again, glass is, is important, so I thought of meat, okay, let, let's think of it as a retail. Let's retail meat. Let's not put it in this uh, environment that's um, not appealing. So we invented this refrigerated glass case. The refrigeration comes from below, and it's a, a different way of, of presenting meat. Uh, Japan, uh, I've done a lot of work in Japan, and uh, this is for Hilton, Tokyo Bay. Um, the Disney people that I met uh, did uh, translate into doing a lot of work at Tokyo Disneyland. Um, but Hilton, I, I remember actually making a presentation to, to um, oh, maybe it was about 80 uh, Japanese executives, uh, all dressed in gray and white shirts. And I, I had not worked in Japan not that long. And I was making a presentation of, of the design of this restaurant. Um, and it, it, I couldn't get any kind of a feeling uh, when one presents a, a, a project. You kind of try and get some sort of feeling where people are understanding it. This was actually a presentation to the Hilton executives, so they needed to have buy-in to the design. Well, I just couldn't, and, and so I decided I had all these materials up on uh, the area that I was presenting, and I, I took some of the boards and I went down into the audience and I went up to the folks and I said, look, look, look at this material. Look at this piece of glass. Look at this metal. And, and the Disney guys in the back were going, like, no, no. <laughs> that you just don't, don't do that in Japan. And, but, you know, it's risk taking. It's risk taking. It's emotional. It's creative. It's, uh, I, I wouldn't be uh, able to show all this stuff if, uh, if you don't do that. So, so yes, everybody was like, no, 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 no. But these guys actually cracked a smile every now and then. And some of them came over and wanted to see it. And it. Just, you didn't do that. But anyway, it was interesting. I learned. I learned a lot. Um, this is uh, actually uh, Ono, I believe, yes. Or DB Bistro Modern. This is uh, out in Las Vegas uh, for Danielle Balud. We've done seven or eight restaurants for Danielle DB Bistro here in New York, Cafe Balud uh, in Singapore. Uh, this is out in the Venetian. Um, Danielle is an amazing restaurateur and a dear friend. Um, this is uh, Porter House up in Time Warner in New York, uh, a steakhouse for Michael LaMonaco, incredible chef. Um, light fixtures are all designed by us. Uh, here is 4040. Uh, the club for Jay-Z on 25th Street. Um, this was all about, really, as a sports club, we were trying to design a very modern, new take on a sports club. So the idea of bleachers was, was interesting to me. So we invented these sort of marble uh, upholstered bleachers that went up uh, as a, uh, an auditorium, if you will, and overlooked the bar and an incredible array of uh, visual, audio-visual um, uh, TV screens, et cetera. Very dynamic club. Lighting is very important. Um, and Jay and, and is very happy with it. Um, some of the private rooms, there are five different private rooms that are uh, upstairs. It's a three-level com complex. Uh, it's quite extensive. And so lots of uh, private events are held in these. 
Uh, the Cove. Uh, the Cove was one of my um, first hotels. Uh, it's located at, at Atlantis in Nassau in the Bahamas. Um, a wonderful property of, of marrying landscape design and sort of an indoor-outdoor experience. Um, there wasn't really a hotel uh, in uh, the Bahamas that really at the time had this sort of indoor-outdoor experience. So this shot is actually taken from the moment you arrive and get out of your car at the Port de Cachere. Um, you're, you're really enhanced with a piece of, with architecture, but also the interiors. Um, the reception uh, area, this is the concierge and reception area. It's a, a granite water wall. Um, I, uh, Saul Kersner uh, was the uh, owner and visionary behind Atlantis, of course. Um, this property was meant to be a, an all-suite uh, boutique property. Uh, a little bit different from the Royal Towers and the, the water park and the rest of Atlantis. So he encouraged uh, me bringing artists. Um, these were um, his fascination with sea life. Uh, they're meant to, they're cast and blown um, uh, jellyfish-like fixtures that we had blown and are lit with LED fixtures. Um, there's a close-up of it. Um, uh, this is uh, Savoy. Did these uh, fixtures? We designed them uh, on the left for sea glass. It's one of the, the uh, lounge areas at uh, the Cove. Uh, Savoy factory out in Seattle did an amazing job with these. Um, they're they're really beautiful fixtures. And, um, incredibly uh, difficult to blow, actually. Um, Aura, a nightclub. Uh, down in Atlantis, I'll kind of work through the, I think you get the idea. Aura was a, a, a wonderful uh, club experience. We've done lots of different nightclubs over the world, um, a lot of them in Dubai recently. Um, a lot of technology and, and the use of glass and projection. Um, other shots of the bar. Um, again, uh, dichroic glass. I became fascinated with dichroic glass. And, um, so those are the bar uh, areas. And, the use of mirror and dichroic glass behind the barn. Other shots of Aura. Uh, this is a, a young person's club called Crush. Uh, these are glass rods with an LED color changing system. So it's sort of a little amphitheater for uh, young folks to, to play uh, video games. And they run teams. It seats uh, 24 folks. So you can divide it into 12 and 12 or 6, 6 and 6. However, we invented this sort of concept as a a pre-teen, if you will, um, uh, venue. Uh, it has a nightclub, it has an internet uh, component to it, um, and very successful. Uh, Fontainebleau, we, we did uh, all of uh, the Fontainebleau. This is extensive out, outdoor pools, uh, the cabanas, the, the restaurant, La Cote, out on the uh, sea, by the sea of Fontainebleau. Uh, Ai Weiwei, uh, we commissioned the uh, Chinese artists to do uh, the three chandeliers in the lobby. Um, absolutely phenomenal uh, work. They're, they're just beautiful, um, uh, amazing experience working with Ai Weiwei. Um, they really command the lobby. I, I introduced the, the bar on the left when Morris Lapidus first uh, designed the Fontainebleau. It was a blue uh, carpet in that uh, lower area on the left, and it was a Japanese tea garden. So I said, well, what would Morris do today? Uh, 50 years later, um, so we did an illuminated blue glass floor instead of a carpet, and we put a bar with a illuminated back bar uh, as opposed to a tea garden. Well, this uh, little venue actually does seven million dollars a year, and everybody's uh, pretty amazed by the business success of this little bar. Um, that's sort of innovative. That's, I think, being innovative. Um, Sort of a wedding, a little wedding uh, event moment out in the pool. We invented these kinds of uh, things. This is in Rio. Uh, I, I, after a Fulbright being there in 1980, I was uh, invited to return to work on the Gloria Palace Hotel. It's kind of the, the Waldorf story of Rio. Uh, an amazing property, uh, an amazing experience to be invited back to Rio de Janeiro uh, 30 years later uh, to work on a, on a prestigious project. So. We invented a, a double-story space. This was a, a huge architectural endeavor. Uh, in, in the old design of, of hotels in Rio, there was a small little lobby on the street level, 
um, and these were all the ballrooms that were the grand spaces. I said, no, we need to reverse that. Um, bring people up to the grand spaces and make the grand spaces the lobby. Put the ballrooms wherever the ballrooms need to be, but let's celebrate the lobby. Um, so we created this uh, atrium space, actually, because it goes up, as you can see at the top. It, the, the building was 14 stories high. Um, it also didn't really have a pool. It had a pool that was located on the ground floor off to the side of the building, didn't get really much sun. Um, this building is located in Flamingo, which is not in Copacabana Beach or Ipanema. It's a little bit more towards the business center of the city. Um, I said, let's put a pool on the top of the building. Let's put the pool on the top of the building and create a restaurant and a bar and make it better than a beach. So the marketing strategy for the hotel was uh, the Gloria Hotel better than a beach. Um, and in fact, the pool has a glass bottom to it. So the idea was you could be in the lobby uh, and obviously look up at the activity. We, we did have little um, frosted circles, so you didn't have complete vertical vertigo if you were in the pool. But uh, very successful, uh, really wonderful project. Um, another concept in Abu Dhabi, uh, a similar experience. We had good fortune with that, so we took that a little differently. Uh, bar area, Abu Dhabi. Um, this was another concept, a previous concept for it, a, a warmer concept with a large glass fixture. Um, hotel room product, a sort of modern young hotel room product in Abu Dhabi. Uh, bathroom open to, I'm gonna kind of move through this a little quicker now. Uh, the one and only Ocean Club, wonderful property uh, in Nassau in the Bahamas. Uh, this is uh, a great uh, redo of a very famous uh, resort property there. Um, John George has a restaurant called Dune. Uh, we completed uh, one half of the project now. We're doing the other half uh, today. Um, wonderful sort of uh, tried to make a, a bit more of an upscale product, but still feel like a beach and a resort, that it wasn't too urban or too uptight. Um, the glass area at the one and only Ocean Club. Um, this is a, a current Atlantis. We, we were invited to do the, the third uh, next installment of the Atlantis Resorts. Um, this will be a very modern and contemporary design. Um, it will deviate somewhat from the Atlantean, um, you know, lost civilization of Atlantis that we know and the coral colors and all of that. We're actually taking this to a much more modern contemporary place. This is located in Haina, on the island of Hainan. In, in Sanya, it's about an hour and a half uh, south of Hong Kong, and an amazing project. I'm sort of, we have this incredible sort of Guggenheim-like uh, architectural space, which is the lobby. Um, I introduced those fins, were actually cast glass fins. They're being made in China, and they're about eight feet uh, tall. Uh, the artist Howard Bentray, I, I called to, to help me conceive of these things. He worked with me back at at RISD with Dale, and um, his work is mostly cast work. Um, incredible project. Um, really, uh, it's being built now. It'll open in about a year, a year and a half, hopefully. Um, the entire lobby opens up to the sea and the ocean beyond. Of course, it's 1,300 rooms. There are 15 restaurants, two nightclubs, uh, maybe 50, 50 different types of hotel rooms, from standard rooms to Suites, uh, the lobby bar, which again opens up to the sea, uh, glass, light fixtures. I'm working with a lot of Chinese glass artists. Um, it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy it very much. They're very open to collaborative working. Uh, it's, a, it's a great experience. Um, the retail sort of corridors at Atlantis, uh, light fixtures again that are invented, glass fixtures. Uh, one of the restaurants, a Chinese restaurant, uh, the hotel room product, uh, the headboard behind the, the, the bed is a illuminated glass paneled. Uh, it's, it's etched and it's also inlaid with interlayers of design. Um, it's backlit by a dimmable fixture. Uh, it's really quite impressive. I came back for the model room uh, a month ago and it, I'm thrilled. It looks really great. Um, nice room. Everybody, everybody likes it very much. The bathroom is very clean, very simple, very modern. Uh, the glass doors close you off. Um, 
one of the, the sweet products at the top of the building, of course, it's China, so Lazy Susan's and the, the dining room and uh, dining area is a very important um, design, the, the glass fixture. This, this company is working on this with me. Um, the bathrooms, I'm having a lot of fun with the bathrooms. Chinese really love the bathrooms, so bathrooms are really a place to be, a place to spend time in, a place to do really as well as one can. Um, bedrooms kind of over the top. These are a standard, these are just a, a standard suite bedroom. Um, the desire for uh, creativity and color and material is uh, immense in China. They, they are, can't get a, enough, so it's, it's wonderful for an architect and a designer. Um, other, you know, just different types of rooms. Uh, another bathroom product, this one uh, is directly on the, the curtain wall of the building, uh, taking a bath against the window wall different type of suite product, different, different suites. It's a great uh, hotel. This is uh, actually the Renaissance Hotel. It's a new building on 35th Street between uh, 7th and 8th Avenue. Uh, here we opened it about four months ago. Uh, wonderful property. It overlooks uh, Madison Square Garden there. Uh, 260 rooms, uh, new building. We did all the interiors, the restaurants, the, the rooms. Uh, Renaissance uh, wanted to really try and reinvent their brand. The whole idea here was a millennial brand. It was geared for the younger guest uh, workspaces, uh, our version of sort of a Neue House, uh, we work kind of spaces. Technologically, uh, just up to speed, you can plug in and the wireless connections are amazing. Uh, I believe there's a thought now where you can actually get recharged just by being in the bar. They, they somehow wa wirelessly can recharge you. So, of course, that's a smart move. So. Um, these are our workspaces, uh, different uh, conference rooms and ballroom spaces at Renaissance. The room was really fun. I, I worked with uh, the raw concrete. I wanted to keep this room sort of a high moment and a low moment. So bringing walnuts and finished materials like walnut together with a raw uh, concrete and bringing the two together um, really ended up in a, in a nice marriage. Uh, people really like this room a lot. Uh, it's comfortable, it's easy, it's affordable. Um, the bathroom is actually very simple, um, just uh, simple uh, uh, calicotta marbles and um, uh, black hardware. I actually like black hardware. Uh, we did the lower level, the Plaza Hotel. We did, uh, there's 33 different vendors down there. I don't know if anybody's ever been to the lower level. It was a, uh, a very dysfunctional retail area. Um, didn't really do very well, so we put, uh, Started with Todd English's food hall, and it's now expanded into 33 different vendors. A um, lot of different variety of, of different types of spaces, uh, pasta spaces. This is Palm Palais, uh, a, a patisserie we invented for uh, the late chef Michel Richard, passed away uh, six months ago. Uh, Palm Palais is a lot of fun, bringing retail together with materiality and color. Uh, and finally, One West End, we're doing a lot of residential towers. We've been asked to uh, very much bring the, the sensibility of hospitality design into the residential world. Um, so towers now are being done with, um, we're inventing lots of amenity spaces from uh, indoor, outdoor, uh, grilling areas, cabanas, fireplaces, screening rooms, billiard areas. Uh, the amenity, it's becoming a hotel, so your residence really is, is acting more like a resort hotel. Um, um, display kitchens, this is one where you could, uh, a friend chef, or you could invite someone to be a guest chef if you had a one bedroom apartment, and you know, really couldn't have a dinner party for 12 or 13, you, 14, you could, you could bring, uh, utilize these types of areas. Um, very interesting thinking. Um, the door drop, just trying to be thoughtful a little, uh, you know, I hate it when they, the, the papers and stuff just sits on the floor. We created a little urban mailbox for you if, if you have a, uh, an apartment in New York. So it's a place to actually put things. Um, our, kitchen, our kitchen products are, I learned, uh, tried to bring everything I, I've ever learned from chefs, from every chef I've, I've known, um, from Danielle to Bobby Flay to John George, everybody's taught me lots of little tricks and techniques about how to handle cutlery, how to handle different stations, prep stations, co coffee stereo stations. So all of these kitchens are designed very uh, willfully uh, from a program standpoint. Um, in the back you can see sort of a barista little coffee station and tea station. 
Uh, we have baking stations, we have bar areas, coffee areas, um, very well received. Bedroom product, bathroom product here. Um, uh, one of the, the two-story uh, uh, um, duplexes, great duplex opening up onto a, a terrace. This is another one on uh, 281 Fifth Avenue. This is a, another tower we're doing with the architect Raphael Vignoli. Um, wonderful property. Um, I think you've seen kind of a... And, and this, I'm going to end right here. This is uh, right down here uh, at Ashland, the, the new tower at, uh, called the Ashland. Um, it's on Fulton Street uh, and uh, Rockwell. Uh, we're doing four restaurants in the lobby area of this building. Um, it's a marketplace, uh, and the chandeliers that you see at the top were all uh, hand-blown at Urban Glass. Um, dear friends of, of ours, uh, and Urban was gracious enough to, to um, put together a great uh, artistic team of glass blowers. And so it's really a, a wonderful thing to, to utilize Urban Glass and a lot of my work. Um, I'm trying to uh, much, much more. It's a fantastic facility. Um, there's uh, uh, Adam uh, working on some of the fixtures. Um, they're really, they're, I think we made 180 of them. Um, he worked very hard in, in blowing these out. and Very proud of it. It'll open in about another month. Um, just different types of, and, and my own uh, fascination. So I, I love it. It brings a lot of joy to me. Um, it, it's really quite lovely. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry if that was a little long. I just wanted to give a range of, of work and, and what we do. But uh, thank you. I appreciate it. it. It's a wonderful journey. Um, so, so I guess finally uh, I would just like to say to you all, you know, don't be afraid of seeming uh, overly dramatic or being overly emotional. Just say yes to challenges. Uh, win or lose, the attempt to create and innovate will build your character, and you will be proud that you tried. Um, after all, success can't be achieved if you don't make the attempt in the first place. An innovator has the spark and the courage to take action when others hesitate. Um, I really feel going out into that Japanese audience uh, was important and solidified the project for us, even though there was a lot of naysaying. Um, it's interesting how it goes, right? If you desire to improve your world or even your situation, then creativity, I believe, will help you. It will help very much open your mind and, and allow you to see things that you may have not have seen uh, without opening the, your mind up that way. Uh, creativity is the joy of not knowing it all. Uh, it's the ability to see or imagine opportunity in, in life's challenges. Creativity and innovation always go hand in hand. If you cultivate innovative thinking in an environment that nurtures creativity, like I believe right here at SFC, um, it's a very creative environment. It's a very nurturing environment. I, I, I feel that. Um, this kind of thinking is, is right here, and there's no telling really what, what ideas anyone can come up with if you allow yourself to think that way. Um, the possibilities for innovation and creativity are endless, I've found, but only if you build within yourself the capacity to seek out and find them. I think we should always remember to keep an open mind. True progress comes in the wake of alertness of new ideas and the ability to look differently at things. I, I, it is the knowledge, really, that we put into use in service to others and in the pursuit of, of progress and innovation that this is where the real treasures lie. It's, it's a treasure that really is multiplied by all of us and by however many people that we can touch um, and inspire. Um, I, I think in conclusion, I've, I've, learned a, I've learned a very successful philosophy, actually. Um, it's something like I call the laminated principle. And it works something like this. If you make a promise, you make a promise and you deliver. You accept an assignment and you fulfill it. You attempt something impossible and you pull it off. Finally, year after year, maybe decade after decade, one accomplishment, one achievement on top of another, one accomplishment on top of another, and promises kept and commitments fulfilled. 
Your reputation is now like a laminated beam. Your, your, your durability and power is there. People believe in you, and they take you at your word, and they will sign a contract with you because they know that you are going to deliver. That's a really important thing to me, and I, I always remember laminate, laminate. Just keep working, keep staying on top of uh, what, what one is doing. I, I hope that everyone here is as, is as lucky as I have been in knowing someone in their life that has inspired, encouraged, and supported them. There is much that we cannot control and that cannot be given to you. The courage and tenacity to do right as you see it and your determination to know yourself and to live up to your best is within all of our responsibility and, and power. I applaud, uh, honestly, you all for the risk in not just taking the road less traveled, but for paving new ones and for the enthusiasm with which you consider bold and new ideas and the courage you manifest to make sweeping change. I wish you all much success in making a brighter world, a place of more and more accomplishments and of more wonderful dreams and ideas. I'm very proud to be in the company of this talent today, and I look forward to a world that will be, in ways great and small, transformed by all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Light, one too long. Sorry. Light is everywhere. People go out to eat for the light or to get out of the house, but the light is part of it. I'm a registered dietitian. It's healthiest to cook at home. How can hospitality lighting be transferred to residential spaces? Hmm. And do you aim for warm, cool daylight, or can you give us some thoughts on that? Great, great question. Lo wonderful question. Thank you. I, um, warm, warm without a doubt. Um, incandescent, but from an energy standpoint, of course, we have to uh, say goodbye to incandescent lighting. LED lighting, however, has come quite some distance in the last few years. Um, the Kelvin temperature is becoming much warmer and warmer. Uh, I am a huge non-fan and disliker of fluorescent lighting. Um, you want warm light. Uh, you, you can't look at food doesn't look the same. It doesn't, you know, even in the kitchens that I do, I insist on non-fluorescent lighting. Um, we'll work with LED fixtures so that the color rendition in a commercial kitchen. Danielle, Danielle Balud insists on uh, incandescent lighting, essentially. Um, so in, in residential kitchen design, <laughs> it's been an interesting question. I, I had tremendous um, budget uh, discussions with the developers, of course, who want to put four downlights in a, in a kitchen and their compact fluorescent lights. Um, I refuse to do that. It, uh, lighting needs to be uh, controlled indirectly. Um, you want to light up surfaces rather than uh, objects. So lighting the back wall of an under counter, uh, uh, it, it's a simple solution, but the reflected light from that will render what you're doing much more pleasing to look at. Um, something like that. Great question. Lighting is big. Thank you very much, Mr. Beers. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, I guess as a scientist, um, and you do a lot of work in Japan, and I was wondering if you have to train in making materials that are earthquake proof. Ah, well, interesting, you, you, you know, yes. The answer, of course, is yes. I'm, I'm finding even more challenging. We're doing uh, quite a number of cruise ships these days. We're, we're doing, um, and the choice of materiality is extremely uh, uh, ruled by vibration and movement. Nothing can actually be bolted. Everything has to move. So in, in Japanese design, of course, it's the same philosophy. Earthquake design, things are on rollers. Everything is on either on a pin, so it slides, or can slide, or on a roller, so it can roll. Um, it, it's. Uh, I, I, you know, as much as I, you know, glass is sort of a frowned upon, but on, on the other hand, you can use the material if you detail it properly, if you allow the material to float, if you will, to, to move. 
Um, the cruise ship stuff is very challenging, really amazing, like walls. I can't do a wall without it actually having to be able to move. It's, it's, it's crazy. Learning a lot, learning a lot. It's interesting. Thanks. We're, we're um, going to be doing quite a lot of work in Dubai. We have uh, a hotel uh, about to start up in Abu Dhabi. We have a three restaurant projects in Dubai um, and a very large entertainment complex. Um, Dubai is a very interesting uh, place in the world. I, I found it to be uh, the next New York, to be honest. It, it's an incredible melting pot of many, many different cultures. Um, it, it's really growing and it's a fascinating place to visit, by the way. Um, and, and I think even in three years from now, it'll be more fascinating. So we're doing a lot of work in Dubai. And in fact, um, Japan, I think I might have an opportunity to, to return to Japan. Um, there's a number of hotel projects that we're going to be starting there. Thank you. Nice question. Thanks. Um, so I know she was asking about like earthquakes and is it like stable for earthquakes? But I see most of your like buildings and hotels and stuff, they're like really open and, you know, have a wide space. Are they, are they built for like other disasters and stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> Hurricanes are not my friend. <laughs> they're, they're not. <laughs> we're, uh, in fact, we're redoing a number of resort properties in the Caribbean. Um, we're, we're working in Anguilla, uh, in Antigua, and in Puerto Rico. Um, all of these properties, of course, are, are very uh, in the line of, of hurricane um, problems. So to the extent that the places have to be able to um, withstand, is, the, the answer is yes, they do. So it becomes a choice of materials. Um, lots of stones. I can't use as much glass as I would like. Of course, we're working with stones and woods, um, but essentially, we have to consider the fact of a hurricane coming through. Um, that is always the, the biggest concern. But I, my heart is in open spaces. Thank you.